lift this. Can you help me lift this up without breaking the cable? Just the arm, yeah. Beautiful, thank you. Well, you have. I think you have to trigger it. I think you have to trigger it somehow from the laptop. Okay. Also, how it seemed a bit long. Yeah, I won't. Uh, so you'll see how much time we have left if, if somehow we're done very early. <laughs> you can force people to watch every con every condition in your experiment in detail. <laughs> The darkening also doesn't work. This, this, the, the room is dead. It's being... Uh, yeah. it, it, it's but uh, Jason was able to darken me. So yeah, I'm but the room's being fixed right now. Okay. So, uh, by the contractor. So, I wouldn't try anything. That's all. Good enough? Uh, is it it not, it may not be so good for the camera, though. Oh, there is a big crowd. Okay, it's 11 a.m. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speakers today. It's Jason Woodward and Christoph Borst from Lafayette, University of Louisiana. Um, as you know, occasionally during the year, we invite stellar researchers from around the world. And now we have the great pleasure to have Christoph here for almost a year. He's going to collaborate. Uh, with us and hopefully some interesting projects. And Jason will be with us for another two, three months in January. So it's my great pleasure and help me to welcome them. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, my talk will be a little different, I think, than the typical talk because I'm not focusing on, a, on one central message. Uh, one of the purposes of this talk was just to introduce myself to the hip lab members. Uh, and so I'll tell you a little bit about how I got into VR and, and how I met Rob and this kind of thing. And then I will give some research examples, but it will, it will be a bit of a shotgun approach of throwing out a, a few different topics. So we've, we've called our talk Swamp VR because we are from Lafayette, Louisiana. And this is a photograph taken on our campus. I got this from Wikipedia. Uh, this is the swamp by the University uh, Student Center. And it does have alligators in it. Uh, but when the alligators get too big, they are removed because our university is very worried about student retention and graduation, so they prefer the students to graduate rather than to be eaten. Um, if you didn't catch my name, this is my name uh, and title. And the important thing is I always try to put the W in my name because there's another Christoph Borst who works on a similar area, and I'm tired of getting paper re review requests that should go to him. Right? So. Uh, <clears throat> I had a uh, friendlier picture of me eating a piece of bacon pizza, but the uh, colors here on the projector didn't come across very well, so I went for the more professional photo. And uh, Jason Woodworth, who's a PhD fellow, uh, who's visiting me here for a few months, visiting all of us. And he will take the uh, later part of the talk. So in case you don't know where Louisiana is, 
So a few people have asked me, we're down here on this big island called the American continent. We're down here uh, where the hurricanes come in, so we don't have earthquakes, but we fear hurricanes. Uh, this, is, this region is the home of the Cajun people. These were mostly French descendants who settled on the east side of Canada, and then they refused to submit to British rule, so they were kicked out, and then they settled down here. Uh, to tell you something about our university, we have a uh, long history in computer science. We had a graduate, uh, a master's program in computer science since 1962, which we claim is the first program of its type in the U.S. Uh, people who have been working in VR for a while, they might remember us from the VR 2009 conference because we were the site. Rob! <laughs> okay. <laughs> We were the site of the, the VR 2009 conference, and uh, so Rob remembers, because he's the only one who was there, maybe. Was anyone else there? <laughs> we had this, we had this uh, visualization facility with a nice big glowing egg, so that when people drive by, they're impressed by it. What's inside is a cave-like display. This is a VR display where pro projected images are all around you. Uh, but the nice thing is you can also program the visuals on the outside to make nice light patterns to impress drivers. <clears throat> yeah, I didn't know you would be here, so I put a picture of you here <laughs> so I wouldn't miss you. Yeah, so I'll tell you, I'll tell you something about how I met Rob, and I, I don't know if he knows. I don't know what he remembers. Uh, I was a graduate student working in a robotics lab, and I was working on tele telerobotics projects, and these are two examples. Uh, the, the one on the left, we were trying to uh, control a free-flying camera in the presence of network delays. So we were uh, using things like graphical displays that use predictive simulation. And then sometimes the prediction's incorrect, and you have to figure out what to do. And the techniques were very closely related to what people were, were using in video games to uh, deal with avatars running around in, in games like Doom in the 1990s. And then the other uh, image here is from a telepresence project where the robot had cameras on it and the head was tracked and we were using VR equipment so that a user could see an environment from the robot's perspective. This is a standard kind of telepresence setup. Uh, but from here I got interested in VR and I just started working uh, purely on computer graphics driven VR instead of telerobotics. And I was working on a uh, virtual control panel. That was my PhD thesis. The interaction was the virtual control panel. And my very first VR conference, uh, I saw a paper there from Rob. Uh, and I'm sorry, Rob, I don't actually remember you from this conference. But I remember your paper. And I was struck by the similarity between what he was finishing up and what I was starting, which was uh, to, to interact on a panel. And the task was different. He was, put, he was putting something like a GUI on the panel. And I was more interested in the panel that is, looks something like a, a cockpit or some, uh, uh, some kind of control panel. That was my very first paper. My very yeah. first paper. Congratulations. <laughs> and then uh, later I started getting into tactile arrays. And I built a little controller to control this 2D tactile array. And I went around and I gave up demo like this, this was remote social touch. That is one user would put the finger on a laptop touchpad and, and, and move around and another user would put the hand on this tactile array and, and feel the pattern from that first user on the touchpad. So it was a way for you to touch a remote person's hand and they would experience some sense of touch. But a, a year before this I went to a, another VR conference. The VR and haptics used to meet together and there was Rob with his tactile box, and he, I think you were showing a tactile bill, but yeah. some kind of tactile, right? And that's the first time I specifically remember you and talking to you. Uh, but I was like, who's this Rob Lindemann guy? You know, I could go to a conference, then I'm working on something, he's already got a demo. So I should, I should either find a topic, another topic that Rob's not working on yet, or I should work with him, right? And I'll tell you one more thing about him. The whole presentation's not about Rob, don't worry. <laughs> I'll tell you one more thing about him. So my first, my first paper at VR, uh, this was either 2003 or 2004, this was the one in Chicago. Uh, before I went up to give my talk, I was sitting next to, to Rob uh, near the back here, possibly in the, in the balcony or in the back. 
and I was, you know, about to go up and begin the session with my paper, and uh, Rob said to me, are you nervous? And I said, no, not really. And then he said, you should be nervous. <laughs> so he tried to mess up my first VR talk. Okay, anyway, I went to the uh, University of Louisiana and at Lafayette to set up a VR lab, and I worked on different uh, applications over time. Uh, but my, my main interest then was, uh, so we would develop an application, for example, to geosciences exploration or visualization systems. So my main interest was how do we improve the interfaces or the 3D interaction. So usually I say my main area of interest is 3D interaction. At the time, I got a lot of demos of other VR-based visualization systems. And a lot of times they had very nice visuals, but they tended to have very bad interfaces. Uh, so I wanted to make some contribution there. I don't have time to go through all the different applications, but I wanted to just pick one, because this is the main one that we are working on recently. And also, Jason is working with me on this one. Uh, this is networked virtual reality field trips. So I'll show you a video that I hope will make this very clear. The person on the right is in the role of a student. He is taking a field trip of a virtual solar energy plant. Um, and Jason is being streamed into the environment uh, through a network. And he will be uh, uh, represented by this mesh that is captured with a Microsoft Connect device. So it has some depth to it. So it doesn't look as clean as something like a green screen but it has some depth to it. If he moves closer, or if he points in different directions, you get some sense of the 3D uh, pointing. Welcome to the Virtual Energy Center. This is a scale model of an actual energy facility located in Crowley, Louisiana. We're going to be using it to teach you about solar energy production. Now, if you look behind me, you'll see the two main areas that we'll be visiting. The solar collectors, where the sun's energy is collected, and the generator, where it's turned into electricity. Let's move over to solar buttons. Can you teleport us over there? So I, I've, uh, I'm going to skip ahead a bit because this goes on for several minutes. But you can see the, the, uh, the user can go through and click on different interactable items to see animations that reveal something about how, uh, how this facility works, how the energy production works. And I'll show you another clip that shows some two-way communication between the teacher and student. So one of the nice things about having a live, live teacher there is the teacher can adjust the feedback according to the, the student's understanding. Um, 
And one of the motivations for this application is that our university runs a real solar energy plant. And one uh, part of its mission is education, so they give real field trips. But there are only so many students who can visit the real plant. Do, you know, there's ec there are economic constraints, scheduling constraints, geographic constraints. So with VR devices getting much cheaper, uh, it's, it's going to be feasible to deliver this kind of uh, experience to someone's home or to a school. And the nice thing about uh, the network component with the instructor there is they could still meet an expert instructor. So part of the nice thing about field trips is not just going to the place, but it's meeting an expert. And you can ask questions or get instruction that you may not get from your usual teacher. Uh, to give you a quick overview of the technology, we use some tools like Unity and TeamSpeak, which does the audio and FFM tag, which does uh, the video encoding. <clears throat> but it, we found it very hard to, to make these things work with Unity, so Unity wasn't set up that well for these non-standard kind of use of the, the uh, networking. Uh, so my students were ripping their hair out for a while trying to figure out how to make this work, but it worked out in the end. Uh, another part that's maybe more interesting for this audience is we wanted to make the interface very practical and safe, so we didn't want students standing and walking around. We wanted them to stay seated. Uh, we didn't want motion sickness, so you saw the teleport technique sort of steps a student to the destination rather than letting them run around in the environment, which might uh, make them sick. And we wanted it to be just a simple one-button interface so they didn't have to worry about which button to to press, so we wanted to make it very simple. Uh, and we give demos a lot, so we wanted it to be so simple that we could even show this demo to a politician and they would know how the interface works. So the teacher mesh, it's just a single connect, in, uh, single connect scan. So it has some depth to it. Uh, we've cleaned it up a little bit to make it look a little nicer. Uh, there are some other people working on very beautiful versions of this where they have depth cameras surrounding the user. Uh, we made it, uh, you know, quick and low cost version of that. The teacher is not immersed. The teacher is using a uh, uh, large television display. This is a 75 inch television display and looking into something that looks like a virtual mirror that allows the teacher to see where he's pointing. And here, by not immersing the teacher, we didn't have to worry about uh, how do we give a clear representation of their face when they're wearing something on their head. So we expect the that kind of technology is coming in the future where you can immerse someone with an HMD and get a, still get a good representation of their facial expression. Uh, but for now, we just uh, did this to place the teacher in front of the connect and get a clear view of the teacher. There are some other indicators on the mirror. So there are some insets that show the student views. So if there's some misunderstanding about what the student is looking at, or the student asks a question, the teacher can look here and check. Uh, there are some indicators here that show webcam feeds coming from the different student stations so the teacher can actually see uh, the students. And the, uh, these indicators float around in such a way so that when, uh, when the teacher is looking at an indicator, the student feels that the teacher is gazing directly at them. And there we have to take into account where the uh, teacher's viewpoint is and also any motion of the student figure out where to place those indicators. During the whole project, we've tried to get the high schools involved in, uh, the, the, uh, in figuring out how we're going to do this, uh, and also in deploying and testing the results. So we started off having things like focus group meetings where we give the high school teachers very basic demos of the displays, and we tell them approximately what our educational content will be, for example, what the teacher's script will be, and they give us feedback about what is suitable for their students. Uh, we tested various, various types of uh, technology at the school, like a desktop-only version of a VR system and a PowerPoint-only presentation of the similar content, and uh, some prototypes of the VR system. The prototypes didn't work that well, right? They were still works in progress, but we, we uh, all along we were testing different versions. And then our most recent study, which has, uh, <coughs> which now the system is uh, pretty mature, so we had some nice results. 
most recent study is about the students' learning and about things like social presence. And we are still, uh, well, I'll give you the outline. So 88 students participated. Uh, this slide shows our independent variables. One of them intended and the other one in, in sort of an accident of what resources we had at the school. So we, we were, we're comparing the, a networked approach to just a standalone approach. So we have this version that you saw where the live teacher guides a small group of students on a field trip. And then we have a, a version that can just be run in standalone mode. There's no live teacher. It's still Jason presenting the same content. He's pre-recorded. He's wearing the same shirt that he wears when he does the live version. So he wears the same shirt every time. So you know, students don't, for example, like him one day because he's red and don't like him the next day because he's green. Uh, and we've tried to make them as similar as reasonable given the different kinds of, uh, given the different kinds of platforms. So in, in the standalone version, when the teacher asks a question, uh, a quiz pops up, multiple choice quiz for the answer. So it's a little different. It's not exactly the same experience, but uh, it's as close as we could reasonably get it, other than uh, live, this live and pre-recorded and the way questions are answered. And then we try two different kinds of classrooms. Uh, one school gives us a dedicated room to do these tests in. And the other school puts us in a room where the students rotate through multiple activities in groups of five, so there's always a bunch of noise and distraction in the background. And in the, you know, in the, past, we were in the past, we were concerned about how that noisy room was impacting our earlier studies, but we never tested it. We never started the test, uh, tested it directly. So here we tested a little more directly by including it as an independent variable. Really, we didn't have that much choice, right? Because we wanted to go to those two schools and that those would be facilities they gave us. Okay, we're still analyzing the results. I got some preliminary results just this week from my student uh, who's still in Lafayette. Uh, first of all, we, we look at the gain in solar energy knowledge by giving a, a, them a pretest that, uh, that asks questions about the different devices and how they work, and then we, and pretest sto scores are typically around 50%. These are multiple choice questions. Then we go in and we give the test again after the students try the environment. And we compute something called normalized gain, which is a measure of how much of the gap in knowledge is made up. Um, and then we compare the normalized gain between the different conditions. And uh, it looks like these results are uh, statistically significant, but I haven't included the details here because we're still, going, we're still digging through the results. Uh, so the networked version appears better than the standalone version overall, and especially when we have a networked version in a dedicated room, we have a much higher gain uh, than in the standalone version. Uh, to give you some kind of reference point, a gain lower than 30% is considered low by some conventions, and above 70% is considered high, and in between there's this big range of median results. So we're, we're pretty close, we're pretty, we're right up, we're right below that 70% in our best condition. So uh, I'm pretty happy with that result. Uh, then we look at social presence, and this is social presence focused on the teacher. So the questions are, for example, uh, were you able to understand the teacher? Was the teacher able to understand you? What, did you feel the teacher was present in the environment? And here we also see a difference between the standalone and network cases. Uh, we use seven-point seven scale, so four is, the, four is the neutral item. There's the word neutral under the score four. So above four is positive. Um, so we see some difference in social presence between the live and networked, sorry, the live and pre-recorded teacher. Effective attraction, these are questions such as how negative or positive do you feel about the teacher? Uh, and there we also find a difference. And uh, this pattern goes on for some other things we looked at, so I'm not giving you the complete picture of every questionnaire we ask. But we did not find difference, differences in things like uh, simulator sickness questionnaires or basic measures of the student's press, sense of presence in the environment. Uh, and then, just for fun, we asked students if the teacher they met was live or pre-recorded, and most of them give the correct response. A few of the subjects reported that the pre-recorded teacher was a live person. Uh, 
none of the none of these students that experienced the live teacher said it was a pre-recorded person, but some of them, I didn't put this information here, but some of them said it was a mix of live and pre-recorded. And that was about very roughly nine, maybe nine out of uh, nine out of fifty students said this. Uh, and I, the reason I included that question is I've, I I gave a demo with a live teacher, where the person receiving the demo afterwards asked me about this AI. How does this AI work? So I was interested in, in seeing if other people think the live teacher is some kind of AI system. And I, you know, I told him it was a live person, but in hindsight, it would have been more fun to, to talk about how we're developing this really amazing AI that's going to replace teachers, which someone else is doing, right? But I'm not doing. Yeah, another part about this project is we actually test, uh, we actually do network deployments over high performance networks between different cities. And here, some of you know I was gone about two weeks ago in Adelaide, Australia. And what we did then is we had a high speed network connection from my lab in Lafayette to the University of South Australia. And we gave a demo there. And uh, this was really exciting for me to be in Australia and put the head mounted display on and my student appear standing before me. So I, I because I see this all the time, you know, I didn't expect to have this kind of reaction, but I, I had not seen my student for two or, two or three, three weeks. I'm in a, on a completely different continent put on the head mounted display and he's standing in front of me. So that absolutely convinced me that this is you know, exciting work. Uh, and they put, they put me, they, they had this professional sportscaster interview me. So you can see him there with his pen and his paper looking really serious like he's grilling me with some tough questions. Right? Uh, so I'm, I will switch topics. Uh, so that's an example of an application. I also wanted to give an example of an interaction technique or interaction studies that we do. And I'm going to talk about whole hand interaction and especially grasping. So these are some different things I, work, I worked on, but I'm not, not going into everything in detail. And I picked that because it's something I worked on on and off over a period of about 14 years. So I did my dissertation on interactions with the virtual control panel using this force feedback glove in the lower right, which is the Rutgers Master II, and has pneumatic pistons in the palm, and they have sensors embedded in them, so you can detect where the fingers are, and you can apply also force to the fingertips. And the, re the real problem with uh, doing something like this is you, you, you reach out, and there's no real object there, and your hand just goes through the panel, and it's really tough to interact with something that way. Uh, so there are no motion constraints, and you also don't get a sense of touch. Uh, but I think the really critical part is the, the lack of the motion constraints. And back then, you know, HMBs weren't as good as they are now. Graphics engines weren't as, uh, the graphics cards weren't as powerful. You often didn't have shadows or, or such strong depth views in the environment. So people, uh, initially when I tried this, people would tend to just reach right into the panel really deeply or they would reach kind of timidly and never even arrive at the tap panel. Now when we added things like shadows, that got better. Uh, but to deal with this problem, I tried different things like just putting a passive panel in the real environment and making sure they hit the passive panel with their real hand at the same time they appear to hit the virtual panel. And there we had to solve some technological problem like how do we calibrate the motion tracking system right accurately. And the other thing I looked at is, is what can we do with the force feedback glove. So the force feedback glove by itself isn't that great because it can spread out the fingers or it can give some kind of cues, but it can't really prevent the hand from going into that panel. And so then we combine them together. So the, the panel provided the main constraint, but the force feedback glove still gave some indications of things like buttons reacting to presses. So a person could feel uh, something that some indicator of a button click. And uh, I saw that as a the haptic version of mixed reality because we're, we were mixing the, the the real sensation from the real panel with the, the virtual part from the force feedback. Uh, here, yeah, here's a video to show what it looked like. The video is a little bit of a lie because the HMD could not render in this qual uh, quality, not, not in this resolution. But it gives you the idea. What kind of HMD is it? 
uh, virtual research uh, V8, I think. It was about uh, 640 by 480, roughly the resolution. Uh, we, we had to use things like anti-aliasing, you know, we had to make it look reasonable and to make text legible in that line. So, so you saw them like yeah, yeah, exactly. And so we had, you know, we had to buy a pretty expensive graphic system at the time to do that. Yeah, and then I, I, I just wanted to do uh, a look at grasping and manipulation. I, uh, I, a lot, I think a lot of people were moving away from HMDs, going to big projection displays or other kind of VR displays. I was interested in these smaller scale displays, so we built this mirror-based display that you can reach. The idea is you reach under the mirror you see a reflection of a monitor that's above the mirror, but it appears to be below the mirror, and it's, you have the stereo, stereo visuals. So it feels like you're reaching into this small 3D environment rather than being surrounded by the virtual environment. Uh, the idea is to make a small, high-quality uh, display area rather than spreading all the pixels around. Um, and I was interested still in whole hand interaction and in grasping and manipulation. Well, when I first learned about virtual reality, I thought obviously that's the way you're going to interact with virtual reality because that's the way you interact with the world. Um, a lot of the techniques at the, at the time were things like, you know, you, you do a pinch to grasp an object or you do a gesture and there's some heuristic that detects the gesture. And that's perfectly good for a lot of applications. Uh, still now, that's reasonable. You know, I've seen demos where you just press a button to lift something that works works fine, but I, wa I wanted some like more realistic, physically based grasping. So I borrowed an idea from haptics, which is virtual, virtual coupling, or it's, it was also used in graphics to prevent uh, avatars, uh, avatar limbs from sinking into the walls. And the, the basic idea is you connect the, uh, so on the, the mesh on the left here is a, is a representation of the real user's hand configuration based on the tracking data and the, the, the solid looking mesh on the right is the virtual model that the person sees visually and the two are connected together by a spring or you can think of it as a rubber band so that the virtual so that the visual model follows the uh, tracked hand configuration until the track until there's some collision right until the tracked hand goes into an object and then the virtual hand is constrained to stay out outside the object due to the collision response uh, and also at about the time we were doing this uh, there was finally a freely available physics engine that could handle this situation without breaking joints. And that was called Navidex, and it was a predecessor to the, the physics engine that you still use now. And we put those things together, and with the collision detection response uh, in Navidex, we got reasonable grasping uh, behavior. So you can see. So the grasping worked reasonably, reasonably well, uh, but it, it, this, was, this was me grasping. I became very good at this. I, could, I felt very natural, uh, it felt very natural to me. After a while, I, I was very good at this grasping. But I noticed when other people would try it out, they had some problems. So not everyone reacted the same way. And uh, I'll give you an example of a problem. So watch what happens with the hand and object here. And this is the audience participation part. You have to tell me what's happening and why. And there was a hint because you saw the title. So what happened? Were they like pinching it and like not releasing it? Yeah, but do you know why? Uh, I mean, that's the main idea. Because um, the graphic shows the pinch finish where the uh, ball or mesh object is, but they actually pinch farther through it. Yeah, yeah. So people close their hands too far. And then that you, you know from real grasping, you only have to open your hand a little and the object drops. But in this kind of grasping, with this connection to the physics engine, you have to open your hand so it's outside that object. You have to make a large motion to release. And so people would try to release an object would stick to the hand. So in, in when we first uh, published this, we said, oh, you know, we recommend the user uses a light touch to get around this problem. But of course, you can't expect it. you can't expect everyone to do this. Uh, so this is so the uh, 
this is, this is related to this basic problem of how you show the hand model. So if you show it in a constrained way, they don't know where the hand, they don't know where the, how the hand is really configured. But, and if you show it uh, interpenetrating like on the right, they know where the hand is, but it looks ugly. Right? And there are other things you, there are other things you can show, other kinds of visual cues you can show, but these are like the two most basic choices or two baseline uh, uh, conditions. Also, here I'm going to misquote Rob. So, it, one of the things in that, uh, that, that first VR paper I saw from uh, Rob is he looked at, uh, at visual constraints and constraining a, a hand on this panel. And he said something like this, interpenetration, bad. There's a little more to it, right? You, you also did some visual cue about the depth of uh, penetration. Depth. But, but this paper is cited several times for this interpenetration bad. Therefore, a, a, basic, uh, a basic 3D interaction rule is avoid visual interpenetration. And I'm going to challenge that. Uh, and then so several years later at the same VR conference where I presented this grasping approach, there was a, a paper that looked into this in a little more detail. And again, I'm misquoting the person a little bit, but <laughs> the idea is there. This one said interpenetration is bad because of this, this ugly collision. Right? Preventing interpenetration is also bad because we have this discrepancy, right? The virtual hand isn't where the real hand is, and this may create weird feelings or other weird artifacts, like we had this, the sticking artifact in the grasping system. And then they did a study to see, so their, their English is better than mine, by the way. They did a study to see which one was, uh, <coughs> which one users were more sensitive to, and that led to interpenetration as batter. Um, I'm sure they used better language. Uh, and so again, th so this study is also cited as another reason why we have this interaction guideline, avoid visual interpenetration. So considering that sticky object, uh, sticky object grasping problem, uh, I, I had my doubts about whether that guideline applies to grasping, so we, we did a study of that. And I'll, give you an ex I'll show you a brief video clip that just, just gives you some idea of how our studies work. So one of the kind of tasks we have users do is move an object to a target and then release. And we have different versions of this task. Some have gravity in them, some don't. Uh, some require a very quick type of release. Some of them require this counter and a, to release when the countdown finishes, when you hear the last click. And we also have uh, subjective studies where people compare two, two uh, objects and they're actually using different variations of the grasping technique, and then we have interview type uh, portions where we ask people what they're experiencing. But so we did a study of visual interpenetration for grasping, and uh, the result was interpenetration is good, uh, at, least in, at least in terms of our objective performance metrics. That is, uh, when people saw inter, uh, interpenetration, they kept their hands open more, so their behavior corresponds more to real grasping. And as a result, when they, for example, released the object, the, the release position was more precise. So uh, by our objective metrics, by our performance metrics, interpenetration looked good. Uh, but it was also consistent with prior results in showing that subjectively people believe it is bad. And even when we asked them questions like, uh, uh, how well can you anticipate release? We find in the answers that they, they actually believe their hand is further open than in the interpenetrating case, and then it will be easier to drop the object. So they're basically believing what they see. Right? So this is, uh, this is related to visual capture, where your, your mental model of the object, uh, when, when you have conflicting sensory feedback, like you have the visuals telling you one thing and you have your other senses about how your hand is configured telling you something else, your mental model captures the, the, the properties of that visual feedback. So from this we thought about, yeah, what can we do about this? So how do we fix it? Uh, and there are two things we looked at. One is some kind of release mechanism that makes the object behave the way the user expects. So when they only move their hand a little bit, the object should drop. 
And the other thing is we looked at all sorts of diff other visual cues that people have tried out. And this, shows, this video shows you how the release mechanism works. So the, the red mesh represents the real hand configuration. The outer solid mesh is the virtual model. And you can see that the object drops as soon as the red mesh opens a little bit, right? The, the way the user expects. And then after the, after the object is dropped, the, the visual model has to move to meet up with the track hand configuration. That is, the, the solid looking mesh has to move to meet up with the wireframe mesh, or there are some ugly artifacts that do not let people grasp further objects. Their hands get in a real weird configuration that doesn't make sense. So we have, that's, uh, uh, we call that discrepancy reduction based on some work that someone else did. Uh, so we figured out how to exp extend the spring model to do this release based on some heuristic and based on some uh, changing the, the target that the visual hand was attached to. All right. And in this video, just watch the index finger, okay? And see if you see any change in the index finger behavior in this video. Okay, did you see any change in behavior over time? Or not, it all looked the same. It's a subtle, it's a subtle, it's kind of a subtle change. You can also see it in the thumb. Um, if I play it, uh, play it one more time. Uh, for in the, early on, the index finger doesn't move very much during release. And then by the end of the video, you'll see the index finger moves more. Yeah, what I'm showing you here is a video clip of one of the studies that I don't want to go into in detail. I just want to say we did some studies to tune how this uh, discrepancy reduction or this convergence should work uh, by making adjustments, finding a way to adjust where exactly the object sits in the hand. Uh, and we looked at how that affects release precision and also how that affects the subjective experience. So we did some studies to optimize grasping. If I presented them in detail, you'd probably all fall asleep. Yeah. But one of the things we found out is in terms of the subjective experience, users did not seem to notice when the hand was just moving after they release. After they release, the hand kind of moves on its own during this convergence period. So we were very worried about the user experience. It turned out they don't even seem to notice that most of the time. I think it's because it's like selective attention. They're focused on what the object is doing, not on what the hand is doing when, when they release. So they kind of don't even see it. And then we did a study comparing different kinds of visual feedback. So some of these were tried out even many years ago. And then uh, <coughs> some of them we, we tweaked a little uh, based on some subjective studies of our own, of which, which, uh, which parameters users like. And then we, uh, we measured the performance and subjective experience for these different uh, types of visual feedback that give some cue about interpenetration. So that you don't, you don't have, obviously you don't have to choose between the, the, the two baselines, right? You can add additional visual feedback. Uh, and the, the basic result here is performance-wise, Performance-wise, the most promising techniques seem to be the ones that show interpenetration directly, like the ones on the top right, and then the ones that show interpenetration indirectly through something like color or arrows. Performance-wise, they don't look as promising, but uh, they might be good subjectively. And so one of the things we also found was that None of the techniques looks worse than the baseline of just constraining visuals, performance-wise. And none of them looks better than just showing the penetrating hand performance-wise. So we were not actually able to do better or worse than the two baselines. We were only able to kind of uh, you know, mitigate the trade-off in terms of getting a performance close to the penetrating hand, but having nicer visuals that subjects are more uh, 
happy with, users are more happy with. And so, uh, so regarding the, the standard interaction guideline of avoiding visual interpenetration, uh, it should be maybe, at least for grasping, it should be rephrased or restated into provide interpenetration cues. And then based on our grasping study, it looks like the direct representations of interpenetration are the promising ones. And uh, we got uh, the most promising results in, in our opinion with this two-hand technique where you show uh, both hand models at the same time. And so probably this is someone can come up with a prettier way of rendering this that may be even nicer, but uh, if you have to pick one technique, I would pick this as your starting point. And one, I think this is my last video clip. This is just an example of how we uh, had users tune parameters of these techniques to also try to figure out what kind of visual feedback they like. So we have a knob there and they can, and here they're tuning the, this transparency effect to kind of see what level of transparency they like. And so in several, several of our studies we had users tune something with this knob so we could, uh, we could figure out what they like. And I'll hand it over to Jason now. Thank you. Come back to Paula. Uh, so as you said, I'm Jason. Uh, I'm here because I think about a year ago now, Dr. Horst walked into our lab and said, uh, does anyone want to come with me to New Zealand? And I figured that sounds like fun. So. <laughs> A year later, here I am. Uh, so a bit of an overview of me. As you said, I am a PhD student. Uh, this is my first semester as a PhD. Uh, I got my bachelor's in science in computer science in 2015, my master's this year, and my PhD, hopefully sometime within the 21st century. Uh, my research interests currently are in uh, VR as it applies to educational uses, uh, hence our virtual energy center thing. 3D interaction, specifically in terms of movement and pointing and things like that. Uh, eye tracking and game design. Uh, my master's thesis was on, oh, discovered the title, it's a shame. Uh, it was on uh, searching over encrypted data in the cloud. I was working with a person doing cloud computing in a completely unrelated field. So to save you all from that, I will just skip that part. Uh, so when I first came to work with Dr. Borst uh, about a year and a half ago, I started on the Virtual Energy Center and my task was to uh, help make this teacher interface a little bit better because uh, we had just recently started to use that technique and we, uh, a few problems that um, were noted were that the teacher did not know how to point in the environment. So the teacher was given a mirror view, mirror view of themselves uh, so they could see what was around them and point to things in the environment so that the student could understand what they were talking about. But the teachers very often would just sort of do this, uh, kind, of, this kind of pointing even if the object they were pointing at was way back there or in front of them. Uh, so that led to confuse students and we tried some other physical approaches to fixing it such as just sort of marking the room with sticky notes but that is obviously very impractical uh, so I was tasked with creating some visual aids uh, for helping them point more accurately so that they could actually see what they were pointing at in the system uh, the other thing were eye gate was eye gaze indicators um, such as those on the screen there and the idea is that if we, are, if we want to enable direct communication between a teacher and a student, uh, it's going to seem pretty odd if I'm trying to talk to you and I'm looking in a completely diff different direction. Even if I use your name, you might not totally get that I'm trying to talk with you. Right. <laughs> and I think Dr. Forrest already covered most of the uh, details on the study that is sort of in progress, or at least we're writing it now. Uh, my role was the teacher, so I was recorded uh, wearing this 
outfit and then had to repeatedly wear that outfit every time we went to schools. I had to keep my hair dyed the same color for about eight months, which was just maddening for me. Uh, and uh, we even couldn't let the students see me beforehand, so we had to sneak in uh, before school started and hide me in a closet somewhere so that the students would really not know whether or not I was actually with them. Uh, so my main interest in the project is seeing how the educational value of the, project, of the program uh, changes when it goes from standalone to live, and I'm happy to see that live is seeing some more educational value to it. Uh, so after we developed those visual cues, we had developed far too many of them, I think 11 or so. And we wanted to see uh, which one is uh, the ideal method for having someone point in this virtual mirror interface. So we decided to do a study on that uh, in which we, this will play. <coughs> we uh, performed a study on it in which we gave the user nine different techniques that they could use. Uh, they had a first session in which they could alter the techniques, sort of how uh, they tuned the grasping techniques. So they could alter them to their preferred state, and then they would go through a session doing this sort of uh, Fitz Law study type uh, interaction which they just pointed at a bunch of targets on uh, their side. And we would collect data on how long it took to click and how accurate they were uh, when they clicked on the target. Um, so we found out that uh, the, using the use of the visual cues uh, pretty dramatically improved error in terms of uh, the depth at which they were pointing, because that's the more difficult thing to gauge when you're using that sort of indirect view. And we found that it had a, that the visual cues had a much uh, smaller variance, which is very nice. But uh, just saying that having something is better than nothing is not very interesting. So now we're extending that into a study in which we uh, look at more carefully how the people move when they're given those techniques. So one thing that we have kind of found by now is that uh, all of our results in the pilot study suggested that users would take uh, about two seconds longer to, to uh, select the target if they were given <coughs> the, uh, the visual aids. However, uh, looking at these charts, it kind of suggests that they actually get pretty close to the value. They, they complete this, this course motion uh, fairly quickly, and then they just sort of take a while to realize that they're there. Uh, another thing that we're going to be working on in the future is incorporating eye tracking and biometric data from a wristband or something like that to improve the communication between teacher and student in the virtual energy center uh, by using that information to sort of try to gauge uh, the, the student's engagement or mood level while they're in the system. And uh, that's it for us. Center, I, I assume. Uh, so I had to uh, learn a learn a script for the Virtual Energy Center, and I had to talk with uh, I'm not sure if he's the director of the actual Energy Center, 
or just someone who works there. But we had to talk about the properties of solar energy uh, a good bit and how this facility worked. So whenever the students asked a question, I would uh, sort of just try to answer it based off that knowledge. Yeah, I mean, like, when it's pre-recorded, do you have some Oh, point when it's pre-recorded, um, if the, the students aren't able to ask questions, mm -hmm. uh, but we do give them a quiz uh, after every area or so, so that they can kind of reinforce what they've learned. In the live version? No, um, or in the pre-recorded one. There is no way for them to uh, give any input about what they would like to know more. No. No. No question. Um, with your pointing task, um, did the thing proceed when they clicked on the actual object, or would it go to the next task if they just click anywhere? Or like, how did you do that? Uh, well, we didn't, in, we didn't enforce yeah. accuracy. Uh, because we wanted them to be able to be inaccurate when they were using just the baseline. Uh, so we would just tell them to point to the target as quickly as they could while still maintaining a sense of accuracy uh, and that they should only click on it when they feel that they've gotten close enough. So it's kind of more of a modifier that's... Yeah, it's, uh, it's difficult to adapt it to that sort of 3D pointing, but we did what we could. If that's it, then thank you. Again. I guess if anybody has some questions for Crystal, in case happy to accept some questions too. You? Oh, no, no. oh that's great. Right. Yeah, Crystal, thank you. <laughs> You're stopping the recording. Yeah. Uh, I've got a question, Crystal. <laughs>